Coming up, the Midland surgeon under investigation, accused of carrying out hundreds of unnecessary operations. How a storm in the Sahara Desert is kicking up dangerous levels of pollution in the Midlands. And strike me, the latest arrivals at Twy Cross Zoo. That's at six. The Midland surgeon being investigated, accused of carrying out hundreds of unnecessary operations. That's next. Catch up with the latest from around the world and the rest of the country in 30 minutes. Now it's Wednesday's ITV News. Hello and welcome to ITV News Central in the Midlands. On the programme tonight, fresh allegations for the Birmingham surgeon under investigation for giving hundreds of patients unnecessary treatment. Pollution levels at record highs as the Midlands suffers from sandstorms in the Sahara. The palate of girls' brows shall be their pal, their flowers the tenderness of patient mind. Why trench trauma from the First World War is still moving students today. And the invention helping this young girl share walking steps for the first time. Good evening. Lawyers acting for women who had unnecessary breast surgery now say they're acting for a male patient who had 13 unnecessary colon operations performed by the same surgeon. Ian Patterson is under investigation for surgery performed on NHS and private patients over several years. Mark Goff reports. Ian Patterson is under investigation for carrying out unnecessary breast surgery on as many as 500 women. Today, lawyers acting for those women have revealed that they're also acting for a male patient who was operated on by Mr Patterson at the private Spire Parkway Hospital in Solihull. An independent review into the private hospital by Verita discovered that the patient, who wishes to remain anonymous, had 14 operations on his colon. 13 of these operations were completely unnecessary and, in fact, his treatment should have been much simpler. He only needed medication, he was referred to the appropriate surgeon, turned out he only had colitis and he only needed medication. Within three days, he'd made a recovery. With his record of breast surgery under investigation and now doubts over colon surgery, lawyers are worried there may be more cases. The concern is, what else has he been doing? Because initially the investigation related to breast surgery, now there's concerns about his colonoscopies. We know that he was also performing varicose vein procedures, hernia operations, um, removal of the appendix, all types of general surgery. The Medical Defence Union, which represents Mr Patterson, said he's unable to comment. Spire Hospitals is implementing changes recommended in the Verita report and said, Our priority is first and foremost the care and well-being of our patients and we're sorry for any distress and anxiety caused by this situation. Mr Patterson also worked in the NHS, which is in the process of settling some claims. Women who had breast surgery privately are being recalled. We're acting for around 500 women who've had either unnecessary um, lumpectomies or cleavage sparing mastectomies. Um, the patients who've had surgery in the NHS, we are settling those cases because they are accepting liability and making offers to settle. The cases um, where the treatment was carried out in the private sector, um, we haven't had any offers of um, settlement or admissions of liability at this stage. Since 2012, Mr Patterson has been suspended by the General Medical Council. Mark Goff, ITV News. In other news, two men have been arrested and bailed over allegations of historic sexual abuse and cruelty against a former resident of a children's home in Coventry. The men, who were both 68, were detained after claims that a child was abused at the old Wisteria Lodge home in the city during the 1980s. The home, which was owned by Coventry City Council, was closed a few years ago and demolished. Police have confirmed their inquiry is not connected to the Operation Utree. 
Detectives are investigating after a father from Birmingham was hit with a crowbar as he tried to protect his family from a gang of armed robbers. Police have released CCTV images to help identify five people who forced their way into a house in Erdington on the 6th of March. They say the father stepped in to protect his son who was being threatened when he was hit on the hand. Air pollution levels in some parts of the Midlands today have reached the highest in the country. A combination of weather factors is being blamed, including a storm in the Sahara Desert, which has left some of us having to clean sand and grit from our cars. It's been causing real problems for people with existing medical conditions, and those who have heart or lung problems are being urged to avoid strenuous activity. Chris Halpin reports. It's an ill wind which has blown nothing good our way all the way from the Sahara Desert. Today, a potent combination of factors meant air pollution levels in the Midlands were some of the worst in the country, reaching a maximum level 10 in the east and between 7 and 9 elsewhere across the Midlands. Dr Roland Lee from Leicester University uses scientific instruments to monitor the pollution. Today, we have a particular mix of, of aerosols that is unusual um, and it includes a number of different imported um, pollutants from the Sahara uh, and Europe but it also shows that later in the week uh, we may have a slightly different mix that people need to be a little bit careful about if they're out and about particularly doing strenuous activity. Those with existing health complaints like asthma were warned against heavy exercise or working outdoors with many feeling today's effects. I'm all right in here at the moment but still now go to the door it starts like and uh, just walk walk into the back place and back again it's uh, really shattered me like you know many of you captured the saharan dust this morning and sent us the evidence while rare here smog is an ongoing problem in world capitals in shanghai they have a flag system which lets everyone know what pollution levels are in schools there are air purifiers and children aren't allowed outside when things are bad a fortnight ago in Paris, to tackle the smog, they made public transport free and 50% of cars were banned from the city's roads. Air pollution was responsible for 8 million deaths worldwide last year, 2 million more than from smoking. The government says they want to keep improving air quality and have introduced a new five-day forecast in addition to investing heavily in local and transport initiatives. Back in Leicester, Dr Lee says more can be done to check the cleanliness of our air. What we want to see as scientists is more measurements, more instrumentation to enable that forecasting to get more and more accurate, as well as better services that tell people in advance this may be an issue and this is the advice we would give you. The forecast shows the dust should settle by tomorrow, a sigh of relief for those affected by this freak Saharan sandstorm. Chris Halpin, ITV News. Well, Lucy Kite will have more details on the air pollution affecting our region in the weather forecast a little later in the programme. The father of a young boy who hanged himself after being repeatedly bullied on the school bus is calling for better awareness, supervision and training to prevent a similar tragedy. Paul Vodden has authored a report that's being published at a special conference on child safety. His son Ben had just started secondary school in 2006 when the bullying began on his journeys to and from school. The inquest into his death heard that the bus driver had even joined in the name calling. Paul has now launched a campaign to stamp out the bullies, as Martin Dowes reports. Eight years on from his son's death, Paul Vodden channels his energies into the rural crafts business that he runs. He channels his grief into trying to ensure that no other child dies in the circumstances that 11-year-old Ben did. He'd just gone up from junior school to, to uh, secondary school and he was taking the school bus to, to school every day and back again. And we discovered that um, he was being bullied by a small group of boys. Um, and eventually one day things just got went completely out of hand and uh, sadly he took his own life. The inquest into his death heard that the only adult Ben could turn to for help, the bus driver, had joined in by calling him names. He told us what was going on and um, we went and uh, took it up with the school. And in fact, on more than one occasion I said, look Ben, you don't have to go on the bus. If you, don't, if you want to, I'll take you to school, it's not a problem. But he seemed to think that 
no, he needed to keep he needed to keep trying and to to uh, to keep going on the school bus. Now Paul's produced a report on the issue which reveals 30% of children who are bullied said it started on the school bus and 15% said the driver was aware it was happening but couldn't or wouldn't do anything. What I'm calling for is for, for training for, for, for specifically dedicated school bus drivers so that they actually know how to behave. But in what other situation would you put 50 children in a tin box with no supervision whatsoever other than an adult who's untrained and doing, um, doing something else uh, important? I feel that there's a need for some sort of chaperone, be it CCTV, be it another trained adult, be it a buddying system for vulnerable children or, or a combination of those. Ben had told his parents about the bullying. They had told the school, the local authority and the bus company, but no one took any action until it was too late. Now Paul hopes his report will be the spur for change in this vulnerable time for pupils in between leaving the care of home and getting into the care of school. Martin Dowse, ITV News. A mother who was visiting a college claimed she was told to stop breastfeeding her baby in their cafe because she was offending staff and students. Joanna Page says that when she complained, the college told her they were obliged to respect other cultures. The college denies this and says anyone on their premises is allowed to breastfeed. Our health reporter Victoria Davis has more. Joanna Page says she no longer breastfeeds in public after she was told to stop feeding her five-week-old baby in a college cafe. A security guard came over and said, I'm sorry, you're not actually allowed to breastfeed here. Um, and I did challenge it and say, well, legally I, I am. Legally I can breastfeed because this is a, a, a cafe. And she just stuttered and said, oh, I, I don't know the rules. I'm just doing what my, my boss has done and we've had complaints. They said, well, we can offer you a staff room. And I said, I'll, I'll just go because I was so humiliated and so upset by the fact that I was asked to stop. Um, and then the lady took me out of the premises. Joanne, who lives in Tamworth, says she complained to Birmingham Metropolitan College straight after the incident in November, but says she received no apology. By the time I got a letter, all she said was that the, the, the college was multicultural and that I would have to respect other cultures. Other cultures. No apology for the fact that I was asked to leave. The college told us breastfeeding is allowed and in a statement said the college serves the needs of a very broad range of students of all ages, backgrounds and cultures. We endeavour to provide a safe, secure and comfortable environment for everyone that uses our facilities and as such Ms Page was offered the opportunity to breastfeed in a more private place which she declined before leaving the coffee shop of her own accord. At no time was she escorted off the premises. It is our aim to ensure that any mother who wishes to breastfeed can do so in a supportive environment. It should be such a normal, natural thing to do. Um, and it should, women should feel comfortable doing it in public. It, it's nothing that should be shunned. It's nothing that should be shooed into the corner or go into a different room. It shouldn't be like that. It should be out there in public. It's a, it's a natural feeding of your baby. Although by law breastfeeding is allowed anywhere in public, Joanna believes new mothers are still discriminated against and says her confidence has been completely destroyed simply for trying to feed her baby. Victoria Davis, ITV News. An advert for a tablet which claims that a so-called clever little ingredient actually stops alcohol from being absorbed has been banned. The Birmingham-based makers of Alcopal claimed on their website that the tablet's guaranteed to improve impairments caused by consuming alcohol. But Birmingham Trading Standards and another complainant challenged whether the claims were authorised on the EU Register of Nutrition and Health Claims made on foods. The Advertising Standards Authority said Alcopal Limited had breached their code of conduct and that they'd not responded to their inquiries. Eight in ten people think 20 miles an hour speed limits should be made standard on residential streets. That's according to research by road safety charity Brake. 
The lower limits are currently being trialled on a number of roads in Birmingham. The report also found 70% would like roads near them to be made safer for walking and cycling. And there is more on this story on our website. Still to come here on ITV News Central, the toddler trialling a new invention which lets her walk for the first time. And with high levels of air pollution across our region, I'll have the very latest on the situation. Find out what's in store over the next few days. See you in a few minutes' time. Now, he was 21, in the prime of his life when war was declared. He was Wilfred Owen, born in Oswestry, and from his experiences in battle would come some of the most powerful poetry of the century. He's credited with cutting through the propaganda and revealing the realities of trench warfare. And as Hannah Stokes found out, in this centenary year, students in his hometown are still moved by his work. What passing bells for those who die as cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. A hundred years ago, a young man from Shropshire went off to fight for his life in the trenches of the First World War. His name was Wilfred Owen, and he would record his experiences in some of the most powerful poetry of the century. He's one of the most celebrated of the war poets, a group of young men who either praised the glory and honour of battle, or, like Owen, showed the world its true horror and despaired at the waste of life. A brutal contrast with his early years in rural Oswestry. The peace, the quiet, the serenity of the countryside and eventually the horrors that he would have seen in warfare would have been, it would have been a big shock for him. It would have really shocked his sort of comfortable complacency that he had. He had a very romantic idea of what the war was going to be like and he sort of joined up almost as a symbolic gesture. I don't think you can fail but see how different it would have been for him. It was a very settled life. He fought as an officer on the front line and was blown into the sky by a mortar, spending days lying amongst the remains of a fellow soldier. He was treated in hospital for shell shock or post-traumatic stress. All this became material for his work. He speaks um, in, a, in a very honest natural way but of course he was incredibly skillful with words so that even when he was he was ill when he was such shell shocked Owen was a long way from this sleepy market town when he wrote these poems describing the horrors of war but just around the corner students here are still studying his work they're just a few years younger than Owen was when war broke out by picking through his poems word by word these English and history students in Oswestry are learning facts and developing feelings about conflict. His life wouldn't have been too different to ours and then he's just suddenly thrown in this war with these horrendous battles and it just would have been really, really hard to cope with. For me it's almost like animals to their slaughter in a way, which makes it very sort of graphic and it presents the real horrors of war. You're family, aren't you really, if you're spending that much time with someone and then to be and then to lose someone like that must be really, really hard. It's quite mechanical in a way, and it kind of emphasises how large this, this war was. They were taught by the country that war was something you should go to. And here he teaches us that you need to think long and hard before you just go along with what you're being told. I think it's that it's real. I think the one thing that youngsters today know is they can, they can see through anything. And the thing about Owen is that he tells you exactly as he experienced it. You get a bit of a punch in the belly and it just makes you feel there's something horrendous here. You know, he's a local person, uh, we really value him. And I think that's something that the children latch onto as well because they get a sense that it could have been them. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs. The Candles may be held to speed them all, not in the hands of boys but in their eyes. The pallet of girls' brows shall be their pal the flowers, the tenderness of patient minds. It's hard to think of a more poignant end to Owen's story. He survived four years of trench warfare, only to die a week before peace was declared, never knowing he'd been awarded the military cross and with only a handful of his poems published. His mother learnt of his death here on Armistice Day, with the town's bells ringing out in celebration. He's now remembered in the grounds of Shrewsbury Abbey with a sculpture. Owen from Oswestry's words will never let us forget the cost of conflict. 
Hannah Stokes, ITV News. Well, the national and international news is just a few moments away. Alistair Stewart has the headlines. Freak levels of pollution prompt health warnings for the old, the very young and the frail. Dust from the Sahara's made matters even worse, particularly for those with breathing problems. Miliband and Cameron trade dunce and muppet insults over Royal Mail privatisation. And now the Welsh Government want to stub out even e-cigs in public places. Join Julie Etchingham and me at 6.30. Now, cast your mind back to last November, and you may remember the joy and excitement as groups from throughout the ITV News Central region competed for grants of up to £50,000 on the People's Millions. Well, we're doing it all again. Yes, the People's Millions is a partnership between ITV and the Big Lottery Fund, which distributes grants from the money raised by the National Lottery for good causes. The application process is now open. Michael Sibbert has the details of how your idea to improve the lives of people in your community could become a reality. The People's Millions is back and this year we've got another four big cheques worth up to £50,000 each to give away in the West Midlands and your organisation or project could be receiving one of them. As you can tell by the kids, they're unbelievable. The Mary Stevens Hospice in Stourbridge were pretty excited to be one of the winners in 2010. You have won! They used their prize money to turn this patch of grass into a beautiful sensory garden to give a restful and secluded space for its patients and their families. It's a project that was put together involving the local community and continues to benefit people living with serious illnesses at the most challenging time of their lives. The whole process um, was a fantastic team building experience, it brought everyone in the hospice together, it really engaged us with the community and raised our profile. Um, it was a very uplifting, exciting experience and from a, a, a vague idea that we thought was unattainable, um, we've got a fantastic garden and it was easy so I'd really encourage everyone to, to follow that idea. So if you've got an idea for a project that will improve the lives of local people just like they have done here, then we can help you make that happen. We're looking for applications from a whole range of organisations or community-based projects. You could be a voluntary or community organisation, a school, a local authority, a health body or a branch of an organisation or partnership. You can apply any time between now and noon on the 16th of May. Here's how you can get an application back. You can visit itv.com forward slash people's millions or call 0845 0 10 11 12. Each call to the application line costs up to a maximum of three pence per minute plus an additional 14 pence setup fee from a BT residential landline. Calls from other networks may be higher and from mobiles will be considerably more. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close on Friday the 16th of May 2014 at midday. Calls made after the closing time will not be counted, but may still be charged. Good luck. 16th of May, so still a bit of time, but put some thought into it. Eh? Yes, good luck with that. Now, uh, on to sport, and Leicester City's dreams of returning to the Premier League this weekend are still alive despite drawing away at playoff hopefuls Wigan last night. The Foxes are now unbeaten in the championship in 20 games after Dean Hammond scored his first goal for Leicester to level the scores in the 87th minute. The match finished 2 all. Well, in League One, Coventry drew nil-nil at the Sixfield Stadium against fellow mid-table side Bradford. Port Vale came from behind to win 2-1 at home to Crawley Town. But there was disappointment for league leaders Wolves as they drew with second from bottom side Stevenage. Now, staff at one of the region's biggest zoos have been busy welcoming some new arrivals and they're the sort which are kind of hard to miss. Yes, these are the four young male zebra, one of whom is just 10 months old. Now, they travelled from France in a lorry last week and are now getting used to their new surroundings at Twycross Zoo in Warwickshire. 
But it is not. It's been 40 years since zebra were last seen at the zoo. And keepers say they're already a big hit with the visitors. Once they're adults, they'll be used as part of a breeding programme across Europe. Well, we haven't had zebras here since 1974, so I think it was a time to go back. I mean, we're trying to develop the zoo and move forward as well, and we're well known, of course, being the biggest primate centre in Europe and every species a great ape. But I think it's time to bring something else in as well, just to freshen up the centre of the zoo, and four zebras will do that. Their horse is on testosterone, so they're quite full of themselves and quite feisty. So now we know. <laughs> Horses on testosterone, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, next to the uh, simple invention, which could change the lives of children who can't walk on their own. Two-year-old Charlotte Taylor has cerebral palsy and she can't sit or stand without help. Her parents have been trialling a special walking harness, which they say has transformed family life. Elaine Wilcox has been to meet them. Go, 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 Charlotte. Taking her own steps, it's a simple invention allowing Charlotte to walk with her twin brother for the first time, much to Daniel's amazement. He's never seen Charlotte really up on her feet before, only in a static standing frame. Um, and for him, just to watch them walking down the road as a mum for the first time holding hands was just one of the most emotional things for me. Um, when I knew I was expecting twins, that was what I had pictured in my head, that I would watch them walk down the road holding hands together. And until we had the upsy, that was just not a possibility. And it, it was just the most magical moment for me. Do you want to go in the upsy? Yeah. yeah? The upsy or walking harness was invented by a mum in Israel whose son has cerebral palsy like Charlotte. The harness allows children to stand with support and the engineered sandals mean they can walk simultaneously. It's Charlotte who decides when and where they go. She actually chooses a direction and if she doesn't want to go, she literally plants herself and, uh, you know, she tells me that I'm not going and, you know, it's just been an amazing time. After trials in the UK, the US and Canada, the harness is now being produced in Northern Ireland. Her parents say it's not only great physiotherapy, it also allows their daughter to interact with other children. Because Charlotte can't sit up. Um, or stand on her own, it makes it really difficult for her to be involved in everyday activities with children of her age. Um, and this has meant that she can get involved in anything that she wants to. She can choose what she wants to go and play with and who she plays with. Charlotte will only be able to use the harness until she's six. Her parents are just hoping there'll be another new invention to keep their daughter walking and give other families hope. Elaine Wilcox, ITV News. It's wonderful, that, isn't it? It's, one, it's like a lot of these inventions, so simple, yet brilliant at the same time. Yeah, and easy yeah. to use, isn't it? Yeah. Great, lovely story. And uh, don't forget, there are more stories on the website, including the university vice-chancellor who's come under fire after partying with students at an awards do. ITV.com slash central. Right, let's have a look at the weather forecast now. Here's Lucy. A short break, whatever the weather, ITV Local Weather, sponsored by Centre Parks. Hello, well a nice crisp looking spring picture for us tonight, taken in Warwickshire. Thank you very much to Graham Rainbow for that. Unfortunately the air isn't that crisp or fresh at the moment, with very poor air quality thanks to all that Saharan dust heading in our direction. This graphic explains things quite nicely. You can see this southeasterly wind while well, it's dragging in the Saharan dust and pollution from Europe and high pressure, which is dominating our weather at the moment, is keeping a lid on it, keeping it low in the atmosphere and it's causing us problems. So another day of poor air quality before rain moves through and clears the air. So weather-wise tonight then, well it's going to be dry with patchy cloud, a frost-free night to come, not too cold either and a dry start to the day tomorrow with a glimmer of sunshine here and there but that won't last because that cold front will move up and northwards through the afternoon so showery rain for us all through the day tomorrow. Once again though not bad temperatures, not feeling too chilly with highs of 16 or 17 degrees Celsius. Yes. That rain will clear overnight to leave us with a bright day on Friday, but it's unsettled for the weekend. See you later. ITV Local Weather, sponsored by Centre Parks.
And just before we go, let's give you a reminder of the top stories on ITV News Central tonight. Lawyers are acting for patients who had unnecessary breast surgery now say they're acting for a man who had 13 unnecessary colon operations performed by the same surgeon. Ian Patterson is under investigation for surgery performed on NHS and private patients over several years. The Medical Defence Union, which represents Mr Patterson, said he was unable to comment. A mother who's visiting a college claims she was told to stop breastfeeding her baby in their cafe because she was offending staff and students. The college denies this and says anyone on their premises is allowed to breastfeed. And air pollution levels in some parts of the Midlands today reach the highest in the country. A storm in the Sahara Desert is one of the weather factors being blamed. And let's hope that things clear up by this time tomorrow. And I hope you'll join us then from me, from Sam, from all the team here. Have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>